the 10 most underrated players of the 2022 MLB offseason. That's what I'm coming at you with today. Players who are disrespected, underrated, not being shown the love that they deserve. That's what I'm talking about today. We got five pitchers and five hitters that we're going to name. Some of these dudes you might have heard of. Some of them a little bit maybe more obscure. But I do think that all 10 of these players on today's video are underrated right now in the market, not going to get the money that they necessarily deserve, and are going to outplay their contract. If you guys do enjoy this video, make sure to drop a like on it. It really does help support the channel. As well as if we hit 3,500 likes i'll give you an overrated free agent video list subscribe to the channel if you have not yet done so click that sub button join the team as well as turn on those bell notifications so you don't miss out on any uploads get in the comment section down below let me know who your most underrated free agent is this offseason as well as drop me a follow on all my social media at giraffe neck link is in the description so for this first guy in today's video we're going to start on the starting pitching market and this guy comes from colorado you probably know who it's going to be it feels like everyone is talking about this guy as a breakout candidate for the starting pitching market because he was in colorado and that's John Gray. And honestly, when you look at John Gray's numbers, they don't particularly jump off the page to you. In 2021, 149 innings, a 4.5 ERA, a whip at 1.33. Like, you're just not particularly excited. But Gray does a lot of things really well. He's got a good fastball with a plus slider. And in Colorado, we know that your numbers are always going to be terrible. It's just really hard for a pitcher to succeed. John Gray was the number three overall pick back in 2013. The talent is 100% there with John Gray, and he is going to break out. Someone's going to get him, fix a few things, make a couple tweaks and John Gray is going to go from a mediocre to bad pitcher to someone who could be a top of the line starter again. And even then when you dive deeper into the numbers, there are some things to like. His K rate for his career is just under 24% and I feel like that's going to be going up as well as when someone is able to tweak him. His breaking pitches actually break because he's no longer in Colorado. I expect that to go up even more. His walk rate's around 8%, which is fine. It's nothing spectacular, but it's by no means bad. And the biggest thing of it all is that he has been a fine pitcher in Colorado, which can translate to being really good elsewhere. I mean, he's had FIPS in the past in Colorado at 3.18, 3.6. He's put up good numbers before. I think he could do it again. And I feel like he's a free agent that everybody has circled and goes, this is going to be one we look back on in the future and go, damn, how did we miss him? John Gray, one of the most underrated pitchers on the free agent market. Okay. So this next player, hear me out. Albert Pujols. I know that sounds crazy. He's 41 going into his 42 year old season, if that's even his real age. And it looks like he's in pain when he's running, but Albert Pujols actually still has some value. Hear me out. I, I promise I'm going to make it worth it. While you look at his numbers over 2021 as a whole, you see a 90 WRC plus 230 average, 433 slugging, 717 OPS, like nothing jumps off the page at you there. But if you look at Albert Pujols' splits, this is where it gets really, really interesting because Albert Pujols last year was elite against left-handed pitching. Again, I will say this, elite against left-handed pitching. In 146 plate appearances, he hit 13 homers, drove in 34 runs, had a 294 average, and a 146 WRC plus with a WOBA at 387 and ISO at 309. Albert Pujols mashes left-handed pitching, and that's something that I think is going to be able to stick next year. If you play this guy solely against left-handed pitching, he can be at worst an extremely valuable bench bat or even a platoon DH slash first baseman if you're feeling crazy. I know Albert Pujols is done. I know he's washed. Everyone wants to throw out those words, but Albert Pujols against left-handed pitching is elite right now. You give him about 200 at-bats against them, and he's going to put up numbers. I mean, 13 homers in 146 plate appearances is pretty disgusting for a 41-year-old player. It's pretty disgusting for a 25-year-old player. Pools is elite against lefties. That's where his value is. Play him the right way, and you can get a ton of offensive value out of Pools. Next up, I've got another former Cardinal here, Tommy Pham. Now, I know Tommy Pham had a pretty dreadful second half with the San Diego Padres. His numbers were not great. He had a 649 OPS, a 193 average. He was still getting on base, but the numbers did drop off. But even so, with a bad second half, Tommy Pham is still a really, really valuable player. He may not be as good defensively as he once was, but with a bat, he still got it. Despite that bat second half, still finished with a WRC plus above 100. 102, but still, it is above 100. An ex-WOBA at 351. He walked 14% of the time last year, striking out only 23%. Those are both very, very strong numbers. He gets on base at an elite clip. And when you look at the baseball savant percentiles, he still very much has it. His max exit velo was 86th percentile. Average exit velo, 77. Hard hit percentage, 84th percentile. Walk rate, 95th. Chase rate, 98. These are all things that are going to stick into next year. Tommy Pham's only going to be 34 in the 2022 season. While that's not young, he's no longer in his prime. Just coming out of it, that's still a very useful player. His barrel rate, 10%. Like, these are all things that make Tommy Pham a more than useful outfield piece and a more than useful player. Not to mention, he's probably going to go dirt cheap on the market. So he's going to be able to outperform that value pretty easily. Tommy Pham, very underrated free agent. Okay, let's go back to the pitcher market now. Relief pitcher this time, left-handed Andrew Chafin. And the reason I think he's underrated is because there's a lot of similar, if you're not really 
really diving too deep into the numbers, similar left-handed pitchers available on the market right now. You have Aaron Loop, Andrew Chafin, Brad Hand, Brooks Raley, and Jake Diekman. Loop had a phenomenal year last year. He's probably the perceived best left-handed pitcher available on the market. Old heads will tell you Brad Hand's the best. Jake Diekman might have the best stuff, and Brooks Raley's probably the best against lefties. But Andrew Chafin does a combination of both. He's very good against lefties and right-handed hitters, and that's important now with the three batter minimum rule. You're able to see Chafin get outs against both sides of the plate, and that's extremely valuable for a left-handed pitcher. Last year in 71 appearances, 68 and two-thirds innings, he had a 1.83 ERA, a FIP at 2.98, a whip at 0.932. He did a lot of things really well. And Chafin by no means has the best stuff. He doesn't throw 100 miles an hour, doesn't have a 95 mile an hour slider, but his chase rate was still in the 89th percentile. His walk rate was in the 69th percentile. Nice. Doesn't give up hard hits. Doesn't walk guys. Attacks batters. A K rate at about 25% and a walk rate at seven. That's really good. He limits hard contact, gets outs, and he does it against both sides. Extremely valuable for a left-handed relief pitcher. And I think right now he's not the top guy on the market. You'll be able to get him at an affordable contract and he'll be very, very useful for your team in 2022. This next player is not particularly sexy and also comes from Andrew Chafin's old team. That's Mark Canna. Mark Canna might be one of the most boring players in Major League Baseball. I mean, he doesn't even spell the name Mark correctly. Who puts a K on there? But I will tell you something about this Mark. He is a damn good baseball player. And while I think a lot of people do know this, his value on the market is probably going to be pretty cheap and you'll be able to get some really good value for it. Last season, 2021, Canna played in 141 games, 17 homers, 22 doubles, 61 RBI, even stole 12 bases, hitting 231 with a 358 on base, 387 slugging, 746 OPS. I think those slugging numbers will come up as he gets out of Oakland, as long as he does get out of Oakland. So he'll be able to hit for some more power. It's a hard hitters park. He still walks at an absolutely elite rate. I mean, Canna gets on base like nobody's business. 87th percentile in walk rate, a 12.3 walk rate, as opposed to 20.5 K rate. That's phenomenal for a hitter. He doesn't whiff. He doesn't chase. He plays a very good outfield as well. 74th percentile and outs above average. He's got a good glove. While the offensive numbers might not jump off the page with home runs or splits or anything like that, Mark Canna gets on base, plays good defense, and still has some pop in that bat that can be useful. At 32 years of age, going into his 33-year-old season, I don't expect a big contract out of him, which is why I think he's going to be one of the most underrated and undervalued free agents. You're going to be able to get him from cheap, and he's going to be able to put up some really good production for you. Not a middle-of-the-order guy, but in that 6-7 spot, absolutely sick. This next player plays right field was with the Brewers last year, Avisail Garcia. Avisail is just like consistently underrated around baseball forever. You know, he had a little bit of an incident in Detroit, and he had some weird years in his like mid-20s with the White Sox, but since 2019, he's put up really good seasons. An OPS plus at 108, a WRC plus as well at 108, hitting 267 with a 331 on base, 453 slugging, and a 784 OPS. Averaging about 20 homers a season, 20 doubles, 75, 80 RBIs. While he does get on base at an elite rate like some of the other hitters that I've mentioned, he does mash. Avisail Garcia is like a weirdly good player, and I feel like because of his size, a lot of people don't realize he's also a great athlete. 6'4", 250, you don't think much of him, but he was 88th percentile in sprint speed this past year. While he does chase and while he does whiff, and his defense in the outfield can be a little suspect at times, but also can be good at times, it's a little all over the place. He hits the ball extremely hard, 98th percentile in max exit velo, 73rd in average exit velo, a hard hit percentage in the 78th percentile, one of the highest barrel rates as well. Avisail Garcia has a spot on a team somewhere. He will have value, and in terms of his defense, DRS has him as a really good defensive outfielder. OAA doesn't necessarily agree, but according to DRS, he's pretty good. There's a world where Avisail Garcia is a very, very good hitter and a sick outfielder. Whoever picks him up, I think it'll be a great move. This next guy is super under the radar. Cardinals fans know about him, but I don't think the rest of the league does, and that's Luis Garcia. I'm not talking about the young one who pitched in the World Series or the guy in the Nationals. No, the 34-year-old relief pitcher on the Cardinals. Now, of course, there is some risk with signing a 34-year-old, but as a relief pitcher, he did a lot of things last year that were really intriguing and eye-opening. Garcia, for his career, has kind of hopped around. He was with the Phillies, the Angels, the Rangers, but he got to the Cardinals last year and figured something out because he had the best year of his career by far. 34 appearances, 33 innings, so not a whole lot of appearances or innings on the mound, but he did have a 3.24 ERA, a FIP at 2.7, a whip under one at 0.99. He struck out 9.2 batters per nine innings, only walked 2.2 per nine, which is huge because in the past he'd been like four or five per nine, limited the home runs and limited the hits to only 6.8 hits per nine. He had a career best K rate at 25.2%. Again, career best walk rate at 5.9, which gave him a K to walk rate of 19.3, which is really good. Opponents only hit 198 against them. They weren't hitting the ball particularly hard, weren't barreling it up. He was able to get out, be very effective, and he throws absolute heat. The dude can touch 100 miles an hour on a sinker. That's gross. So for me, Luis Garcia is going to be dirt cheap. I can't imagine he gets any sort of lucrative contract whatsoever. And this could be a guy who could slot into a pretty deep bullpen and be extremely effective. He's not there to be 
be your guy to get the biggest outs in general. But you can get some serious value out of Luis Garcia for extremely cheap. Let's talk about Trevor Story because we all know that Trevor Story is a good player and normally good players don't really get considered underrated. But because of the free agent market right now with guys like Corey Seager, Carlos Correa, even a Marcus Simeon, Chris Bryan, I know he's not a shortstop, but similar kind of players in that they're both offensive who could play infield spots, even Javi Baez. But especially with this market right now and especially for hitters, I mean, some of the names you'll throw out there, Chris Taylor, Carlos Correa, Marcus Simeon, Corey Seager, Javi Baez. These are all guys that can play shortstop, play very well, and are getting more hype than Trevor Story. Story had a down year going into his free agent market, and that's always going to make him cheaper. He's probably going to sign a one-year deal, and it's probably going to be for around 20 to 25 million. That to me is crazy cheap because Trevor Story is an elite shortstop still. While he did struggle in Colorado in 2021, he had nobody around him to help him. There was no reason to pitch to Trevor Story, and even then, he still finished with an OPS at 800. He still does a lot of things really well. So going over his 2021 season, 24 homers, 34 doubles, 5 triples, 75 RBIs, stealing 20 bases, hitting 251 with a 329 on base, 471 slugging, 801 OPS. Sounds like a good year. Of course, the numbers do get inflated because of Coors. You then go to his numbers on the percentile rankings, and Trevor Story is still barreling up the ball very well. 64th percentile. He's still got crazy sprint speed. He's still got a good glove. Still hitting the ball hard. He's always going to strike out, but I don't think Trevor, but I feel like Trevor Story is just getting discounted because he had a down year. People are forgetting the years he's had in the past where he's been very good. He's been great with the glove. He's been one of the best shortstops in the league, and he's just not going to get paid like it, it seems like this offseason. So for me, Trevor Story, while this is a bit more of a stretch, I do think is one of the 10 most underrated free agents this offseason. He's simply an elite shortstop who's not getting necessarily the love he deserves. Kind of like Marcus Simeon last year. For the penultimate player of today's video, we're going to go back to the pitching market to talk about starting pitcher Alex Cobb. Now, admittedly so myself, I wasn't particularly high about Alex Cobb, but as you look deeper into the numbers, there's definitely something here. And it's super worthy to note that he had a 3.76 ERA last year in just under 100 innings, but his FIP was 2.9. This guy actually pitched way better than the numbers suggest if you're just looking at them from afar. Cobb, similar to a lot of guys who get underrated on the pitcher market, just isn't really exciting. There's like 93, 94. You don't watch him and go, oh my God, he's unhittable. But he was elite at limiting barrels last year. 94th percentile in barrel rate. Only 4.2% of the balls put in play were barreled up last year. That's pretty disgusting. Top 6% of the league. He also was 93rd percentile in chase rate. That means he was getting guys to swing at balls out of the zone at an elite rate last year. They were chasing, weren't hitting the ball particularly hard. While he isn't striking out crazy numbers, he did jump his K rate all the way from 16.8 to 24.9 last year. That's a huge jump for a guy like Alex Cobb. The ability to limit hard hits, to limit barrels, and also getting a bump in K rate, that's massive for him. So yes, while the 3.76 CRA and a 1.264 whip don't scream elite pitcher, Alex Cobb does a few things elite that makes him extremely valuable. He's not one of the best pitchers in the league. He's not one of the top 25, but he's not going to get paid like that. And the fact that you'll be able to get him at such a bargain makes him extremely undervalued and extremely underrated on this free agent market. Alex Cobb, this is a good pickup. And then last but certainly not least, no, it's not Chris Taylor. Chris Taylor's properly rated. He's an all-star. He's going to get paid exactly what he deserves. He's very good. I also want to note, I love Marcus Stroman, but for a guy who's going to get 25 million, not really underrated. And for the last and final player, going back to the pitching market, going to a reliever, Corey Knable of the Los Angeles Dodgers. Now hear me out. I think people know Corey Knable is pretty good. And I think he will have a pretty decent market, but I think Corey Knable has a chance to become an elite reliever again in Major League Baseball. Five years removed from his best season in 2017. He's had some injury issues, but he came back last year and made 27 appearances for the Dodgers in 25 and two thirds innings and looked disgusting. His curveball and fastball have always been an elite combo and it looked like it was back. Again, small sample size, so everything with a grain of salt, but I do think Corey Knable, I think the hype should be real. 27 appearances, 25 and two thirds innings, 2.45 ERA, a whip under one at 0.974 and a FIP at 2.9. 10.5 K per nine, 3.2 walks per nine, 0.7 home runs and 5.6 hits per nine. Very, very similar to the 2017 season. Wasn't striking out batters at the unreal rate he was doing then, but he is still doing things really, really well. When you look at his barrel rates on the season, 4.8%. That's disgusting. Even three barrels last year. Again, small sample size, very, very important, but he got his K rate back to around 30% at 29.7. That's really good for a reliever. Walk rate was the lowest of his career, basically at 8.9%. And his expected numbers even look good, like an XERA of 2.87, XWOBA 2.62. People were just simply not putting good contact on the ball against Corey Knable, and it showed in his numbers. He looked really good for the Dodgers. And I do understand he's not the most underrated player in today's video, but I do think that he has value. He's going to be undervalued. And I think he'll be very good for a team next year, as long as he stays healthy. Always the big question for Corey K. If he stays healthy, Knable can be really, really effective for a team. So those are my 10 most underrated free agents of the 2022 MLB offseason. I'd love to know what you guys think down in the comment section below. I hope none of them sign. I'm recording
recording this a day in advance. You can see you're rocking the Knicks jersey, going to a Knicks game tonight. So I'm really hoping that none of them sign tonight when I'm recording this, because I just won't be able to get a video out, as well as it kind of defeats the purpose of this video. But I'd love to know who you guys think are the most underrated free agents down in the comment section below, as well as drop a like on the video if you enjoy it. 3,000 likes, said 3,000, whatever it was. And I'll give you the most overrated free agents of the offseason. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any of the content. Follow me on all my social media, Giraffe Neck Mark, links in the description. That's where I'm wrapping up today's video, guys. You know the drill from here on and out. YouTube recommends you watch this video. This is my most recent upload. So click through those if you have not yet seen them. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all tomorrow for another upload. Peace out.